The first three episodes of Andor took place in the Priox Morlana corporate zone, a completely new area of the Star Wars galaxy we have yet to explore. And there are no Imperials and hardly any Rebels to be seen. Tony Gilroy most likely wanted us to focus on this individual story more than the larger Star Wars galaxy. And so he kept the usual Star Wars cameos, Easter eggs, and fan servicing to a minimum. But then along comes episode four of Andor and wow. I don't really usually do Easter eggs in these type of videos, but there's simply so much here that I kind of want to point out and explain to you guys because it really paints a larger picture of what's going on in the wider galaxy that Andor exists in. And so today we'll be breaking down the many little hidden treasures within episode four of Andor. There will be some spoilers in this video. Luthen Ryle's ship has been highlighted several times already in the Andor trailer, and now we get a name to put behind the ship. It's a Fondor Hallcraft, a previously unknown vessel. But we do know what Fondor is. It's an important shipbuilding world for the Republic and the Empire that followed it. Located in the colonies regions of the galaxy, it's not as central as Corellia, nor are the shipyards there as large as the one over Quat. But Fondor had more than a dozen different orbital shipyards that could service multiple Star Destroyers. The Fondor Hallcraft most likely was a tugboat of sorts, which puts it in the same class as a Corellian YT-1300, which of course is what the Millennium Falcon is. And so in true Star Wars fashion, what we have here is a heavily, heavily modified civilian freighter. As Andor figures out pretty quickly, this is quite a special vessel. It's got an exceptionally powerful hyperdrive and a weird lightsaber-like weapon that could cut enemy ships apart. Not the most practical weapon system to have on your ship, but Luthen is hardly a practical individual. He collects historical antiquities and rare trinkets. I'm also gonna go out here and guess that his ship is most likely powered by kyber crystals, which explains the unique weapon and the immense power the ship has. Kyber crystals are amplifiers of energy, meaning that when you put energy into a kyber crystal, it actually increases the amount you get out. When on the ship, Luthen gives Andor a swig of Mednog. Kids don't ever accept drinks from strangers, especially mysterious ones that smell of banthal leather, death sticks, and spice. I'm gonna guess here that Cassian Andor is being given a consumable version of Bacta known as Bactate. Apparently has a very chalky and terrible taste, but has great anti-infection properties and is good at helping an individual heal. Pretty sure this will probably be in a video game one day. Mednog, it's basically a health potion. Also, while on the ship, we learned that Andor, at the age of 16, served on Mimbam. He was a prisoner of the Empire. Remember, this kid's got a pretty long rap sheet. Insurrection, destruction of Imperial property, assault on an Imperial soldier. Andor was born in 26 BBY, which means that it would have been 10 BBY when he was 16 years old. This means he would have been serving on Mimbam roughly around the same time that Han Solo was there fighting in the Battle of Mimbam as part of the 224th Imperial Armored Division, AKA the Mud Troopers. Andor was just a cook and apparently his whole entire unit was wiped out. He managed to escape somehow. Things didn't go well, I guess, for the Imperial Army and we can now confirm that the Empire recruited a lot of prisoners to fill out their cannon fodder army ranks. Kind of reminds me of another military force. Now, before Andor is sent along on a suicide mission by Luthen Ryle, the first of many, I'm sure, Luthen gives him a prize necklace, a Kwani signet, as a down payment for his services. This necklace has blue kyber, otherwise known as Skystone, as its central piece. This is a serious piece of bling, but it's almost more of an artifact than it is just regular jewelry. Uh, it was created as a celebration for the Kwadi resistance against the Rakatan Empire's invasion. The Rakatans were a terrifying barbaric species which conquered much of the galaxy tens of thousands of years ago. They predate even the Old Republic. It's always really nice to see this type of old lore being resurfaced in canon again. I'm beyond excited for the return of my favorite world in Star Wars Coruscant. I thought originally like the book of Boba Fett would take us there, or maybe even the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, but nonetheless, it's really great to see this world. I wanna visit it really badly. You guys know I'm a sucker for big dystopian cities, and there's nothing bigger than this Eusemonopolis. First, we head to the Federal District to the Kopnor Complex and the Imperial Security Bureau Headquarters building. 
Notice its beautiful circular design with several giant shards of glass, which kind of mimics the layout of the central meeting room for the ISB, where the various supervisors in charge of different regions of Imperial territory meet with their director. Function meets form. Brilliant. Supervisor Grandy gives a brief on the situation in the Ryloff sector. Champs Amdula, as usual, is being a thorn in the side of the Empire. Supervisor Legret gives a briefing on the situation on Arvala 6. Apparently, the unrest on that planet has ceased long enough for mining operations to resume, which is very important for the Empire's military ambitions. Now, we've never heard of Arvala 6, but we do know about a planet called Arvala 7, which I'm guessing is in the same system and right next to Arvala 6. Arvala 7 is where Baby Yoda was found by the Mandalorian, and that's also where Mando ran into Ugnat Quill and that horny rhino. The planet of Arvala 7 is described as being an out-of-the-way planet where if you leave your ship unattended for long enough, a bunch of filthy Jawas will come along and put it on cinder blocks. I'm guessing that Arvala 6 is probably not that much better. I'm also going to guess that this is an outer rim planet, uh, unrest, a lot of natural resources to be exploited. Sounds about right. Supervisor Young then gives a briefing requesting additional protection to the hyperspace lanes in the Abrian sector to guard, quote, increase in construction shipments to Scarif. Interesting, we of course all remember Scarif, the beautiful tropical world where the Imperial Archives were built and more importantly, where at least some of the construction for the Death Star was done. One area of the planet known as Arak 14 or A14 was an excavation site where a lot of the construction for the Death Star project was being done. The Empire had to try its best to maintain the secrecy of this project, not only from the rebels, but also from the Imperial Senate as well. I'm pretty sure none of these supervisors even knew what exactly they were building on that planet. Next up, we see one of the many starports on Coruscant. This one's a bit more fancy than Westport, which I guess is like the LaGuardia of Coruscant. This is where Anakin and Padme board a rusty shuttle to go to Tatooine. We hear over the intercom an announcement about Telegordo Travel Services' flight to Hosdian Prime Sector in the core region, the future capital of the New Republic, which would be destroyed by Starkiller Base. We also hear about connections to the world of Plexus and Euphornis Major, two other core worlds. Poor Deputy Inspector Karn has arrived back on his homeworld at Coruscant after being fired for being an imbecile. He lives in the Coruscant underworld. Housing prices on this planet are arranged by how close you are to the surface. And while Karn is not in the lower thousands of levels, which is where things get really seedy and terrifying, Karn is also not coming from money. And his mother lives on a modest level, I believe, in the 90s. Then we see Mon Mothma arrive in an elegant looking speeder to the Luthen Rael shop of antiquities. We see all sorts of cool things on display, including a Gungan plasma shield, some Mandalorian Beskar plate armor, an Utapawan monk cudgel, that's these scary looking dudes, and a double headed snake I've definitely seen before in Aztec iconography. We also see a Jedi holocron, that's the cube one, and a Sith holocron, that's the pyramid-shaped one in the back of his shop. These devices are used to store information, but could only be opened by Force users. Luthen also seems to have a rack of small organisms trapped in carbonite relief. Very, very cool. I would love to visit this shop one day. Although, as the driver of Mon Mothma says, Oh, don't bother. I couldn't afford anything here. Lastly, we have this really interesting suit of armor just hanging out there. It's so in the middle of things, it'd be shame not to mention. I'm actually not sure what exactly it is, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here. It's reminiscent of the type of armor used by the Jedi Army of the Light and the Sith Brotherhood during the New Sith War, which ended with the Battle of Rusan. Darth Bane in canon, not the Legends version, wore a suit of armor that looked quite similar in styling to this period. Could be really interesting to see Star Wars revive this period of history as well. Lastly, we arrive to Mon Mothma's beautiful Chandrillan apartment, which most likely is in the Senate apartment complex next to where Padme's apartment would have been. We meet her douchey Kamino wearing husband, Perrin. He's gonna be a problem, I'm calling her right now. And he's also planned a dinner for the governor of Hana. Hana City is the capital of Chandrilla. Among the attendees are Ars Dangor and Sly Moore, two people from Emperor Palpatine's personal retinue and direct inner circle. I mean, this is kind of crazy that Perrin invited these people because Mon Mothma is known for being extremely outspoken against Palpatine. She was actually arrested during the rise of the New Order for supporting the Jedi and committing treason against the Empire. She had to pledge her allegiance to Palpatine in order to continue serving in the Senate.
You can't be serious. These people hate me. They spend every day trying to undo anything I've touched. Either Perrin is incompetent or extremely selfish and just focused on having fun, or it's a mixture of both, or he could be in cahoots with the Empire and is willing to throw his wife under the bus in order to save his own skin and quality of life. He clearly has a taste for the finer things. Mon Mothma then makes this very interesting remark. We should find some Gorman guests for tonight and see how amused they are. Your fun friends just cut off their shipping lanes yesterday. Do you know how many will starve? Perhaps we can laugh about it over the third course. The Gorman play a very interesting role in Mon Mothma's history. You see, three years later in 2BBY, uh, the Gorman massacre would happen. Mon Mothma would publicly blame Palpatine and the Empire for that attack and would have to flee Coruscant as a result because Palpatine was really pissed about that. She would flee with the help of the Rebellion and this would mark the official beginning of the Galactic Civil War. In Legends, this massacre was carried out by a uh, captain, then captain, will have Tarkin. Apparently a bunch of Gorman protesters were blocking his landing pad and he decides to just land his ship right on top of them. So there you have it, guys. Uh, that's all the back, uh, uh, background information that I picked out so far, all the little Easter eggs that I saw from this episode. I'm kind of angry that they're releasing this uh, one episode at a time. I know I just criticized how Netflix releases the entire... Um, season of their shows, but like, I just, I really want to see the rest of this show already. I gotta be more patient. But let me know if I've missed any other Easter eggs or if there's anything else you guys want to be, um, want explained about this episode here in the comments section down below. Also, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our coverage of Andor. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.